In 1971, a military analyst by the name of Daniel Ellsberg leaked to the press a 7,000-page top-secret Pentagon study uncovering years of official lies about U.S. military involvement in the Vietnam War. The leaked documents, known as the Pentagon Papers, were instrumental in exposing the scope and strategy behind the U.S.'s war in the region, and many at the time believed they could change how the world viewed war. Decades later, as conflicts rage on in Ukraine, Yemen, and Ethiopia, just to name a few, the decision-making process behind wars remains as murky as ever. What we do know is that billions of dollars are spent on weapons and defense contracts every year, making conflict incredibly profitable for some. So who benefits from war? And who are the biggest players behind the war machine? An Upfront Special with Daniel Ellsberg. Daniel Ellsberg, thank you so much for joining me on Upfront. Thank you for having me. A large part of your life's work has been committed to not only raising awareness about the dangers of nuclear weapons, uh, but also the money behind them. Uh, in 2020, as the pandemic raged, the nine nuclear weapon states collectively spent an estimated $72 billion on nuclear weapons. And we're now living in a time when the danger of nuclear war, of course, has spiked. Where does this leave the movement for nuclear disarmament, uh, given how much money is at play in all of this? Well, it's kept us from having any real effect on reducing the danger of nuclear war all these years. The movement was quite effective in, in helping stop the above-ground testing and then uh, the, even the underground testing eventually. But in other respects, uh, it really hasn't been very effective, and I don't think the movement was as conscious as it should be of the money behind it and the effect that had on Congress. They we really acted as though it was just a question of what the people want, which was to avoid nuclear war, or uh, uh, just political, uh, strategic aspects of it. It's not needed, it's dangerous, and so forth. And I think they gave very little attention to the role of companies like Boeing, Lockheed, Raytheon, General Dynamics, and uh, they as, as if uh, they really weren't a factor. It's like talking about climate without talking about the Exxon Corporation or Shell or Chevron. And actually, that is the way climate is talked about pretty much. We just don't face the fact that we are facing uh, large flows of money directed at keeping the status quo, which is the status quo of extreme nuclear danger, especially in times of crisis like this, uh, and of climate uh, movement toward an abyss, basically the end of our current civilization, a great reshuffling of people around the world. You, you talk about the, the threat of nuclear war and this abyss that we're headed toward, and that's certainly a piece of it. Another piece of it uh, is war and armed conflict that's taking place right now. It's plaguing multiple countries. You, could, you got Ukraine, you got Yemen, you got Somalia, you got uh, Ethiopia, the list goes on. Uh, but behind wars like that are a weapons industry that you just alluded to that was worth $531 billion worldwide in 2020. And as of this recording, uh, while the invasion of Ukraine intensifies, the stock prices of General Dynamics, Lockheed Martin, as you mentioned, Northrop Grumman, uh, Raytheon, they recently hit their five-year highs. So as we talk about war, we also have to talk about who benefits from war. Can you help me unpack that a little bit? Who's really benefiting? It's the old uh, Latin slogan, cui bono, who benefits? Uh, going all the way back, or in the most you can name, let's just go in the last century, World War I, the uh, loans by J.P. Morgan to the British for arms, where uh, if the British had had to deal or even... Uh, had lost the war to some extent, J.P. Morgan would have gone bankrupt. And uh, Wilson, our president then, could not allow that to happen. It would have been a financial disaster. And that goes uh, on from there on, in particular, well, how, who benefited from Vietnam going on as long as it did, or Afghanistan? Right now, the war that we're supporting in Yemen through uh, arms to Saudi Arabia and the UAE uh, is keeping a, a truly genocidal war going on, or enormous massacre, and I think with very little uh, benefit except to the arms manufacturers. People ask, why don't we learn from our failures in Vietnam and uh, Afghanistan and elsewhere? And the answer is, uh, 
who has a lesson to learn? Those wars were very profitable for the people you named, for Lockheed, Raytheon, uh, Northrop Grumman, and the others. Uh, they didn't have anything to learn. I'm afraid that right now uh, there's two major purposes that will keep the war, that can keep the war in Ukraine going as long as the war in Afghanistan, not in the way that it's being waged now, but by a kind of guerrilla war that we're supporting, that we support, as we did against the Soviets in Afghanistan for 10 years. And the, Af the Ukrainian people would be ground to bits in the course of that, as the Afghans were. And yet, uh, it's very profitable for the people who are supplying those weapons and keep it going. There is one other major motive that affects uh, these things, in particular in Europe, and that is that our U.S. role in Europe, we're not, after all, a European nation, and we have no particular role in the European Union. But in NATO, that's, as the Mafia says, cosa nostra, our thing. Uh, we control NATO, pretty much, and NATO gives us an excuse and a reason to sell enormous amounts of arms to now to the formerly Warsaw Pact nations, which had only second-rate or obsolete Soviet weapons altogether. From the moment that the Berlin Wall came down, Lockheed representatives were in Warsaw selling them on the need for F-22s and for other weapons right there. Against who? as the Russians uh, reasonably asked. Actually, Russia is an indispensable enemy in Europe. Uh, nothing else can rationalize this enormous— An indispensable enemy. That's, 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 that's fascinating uh, language. Break that down for me. The, an indispensable enemy. What does that mean? It means that you can't really justify new uh, Trident submarines or ICBMs uh, that Northrop Grumman is making a whole new ICBM against— Yemen or ISIS or uh, Al Qaeda. Uh, they just don't cut it as rationale for a multi billion dollar arms budget. Only Russia has the targets and the sophisticated arms to fight against. You don't need advanced fifth generation fighters against people who don't have any aircraft or fighters of their own uh, or sophisticated ones. But Russia and now China. Uh, for the future in particular, do offer not just a rival or a competitor, but someone who can be painted as an enemy against whom you have to defend. And, of course, Putin now, in the last two months, has just been a bonanza for the arms people, because at last he's made uh, Russia look uh, an offensive uh, enemy of some kind who has to be defended against with the latest weapons, with new weapons. And, of course, Russia has its military-industrial complex, too. That, that, that's fascinating. It reminds me of the uh, black arts poet, Gil Scott Heron, who said, everybody loves peace. The problem is you can't make no money off of it, you know? Um, but, uh, in the past few months, more than $5.6 billion has been poured into Ukraine in the form of military aid from the U.S., from the U.K., uh, and from the EU. We've seen similar uh, situations in the past when U.S. arms were used by Libyan and Syrian opposition groups. Uh, but what happens when those conflicts are over, or seemingly over? Uh, where do the weapons go? <laughs> it, well, first, it's a long time before these conflicts are over, as you know. In Afghanistan, it went on for 20 years, and it could have been much longer. In Libya, what we did was supply a lot of weapons to people who, in turn, sold them to other insurgencies and, and terrorist groups and others throughout Africa and elsewhere. And, of course, our efforts in uh, Afghanistan spawned, in effect, uh, this was against the Soviets, uh, ISIS, or I should say al-Qaeda, and then later ISIS. So these things have blowback effects. Uh, keeping in mind, they didn't... Uh, these arms industries, I would be wrong to say, they didn't invade Ukraine. Putin did that. However, they and their people they were influencing in the government were willing to risk a war like this coming from their policies, which were, in fact, provocative in terms of uh, making it likely that the Russians, any Russian leader, would eventually uh, react against it, however illegally, just as we reacted when uh, Khrushchev put missiles in Cuba. Cuba isn't ours, and those missiles did not, in fact, threaten our security. And I say that as someone who was looking at precisely that problem in the Pentagon at that time. 
working for, as McNamara said, hey, it's not a security problem, the missiles in Cuba. Uh, it's a political problem. Political because but, but, but we sir, thought... But, it would... This is somewhat, at this stage, foreseeable, right? I mean, after seeing what happens in Syria, with seeing what happens in Libya, or we, as you've done, we could go back decades prior, the weapons end up in the hands of folk who, ostensibly, we wouldn't want to have them. And yet, we continue either to fund them uh, directly or by proxy. Uh, so I guess the question for me is, why do we allow that to happen? And ultimately, what happens to these weapons? What kind of consideration is given to what happens to these weapons? Well, it comes down to who the we is that we're talking about. Uh, it's not just, it's not essentially the taxpayers or the citizens who are, by the way, uh, regrettably willing to see the deaths of others who don't look like us. Ukraine is getting much more concerned about the casualties and the war crimes because it is not uh, brown Muslims that are being uh, victimized here, but uh, by the Russians in this case, but it's white Christians, and that they're like us. And to see them in such anguish and terror uh, creates a public pressure that uh, wasn't there before. But in all of these other cases, as I've said, uh, what's the problem? The we here that matters, the ones that provide the large campaign contributions and that provide the personnel at high levels at, uh, in these ranks, benefit fine from them. There's no problem. Uh, it may not be very successful, but a failing war is just as profitable as a winning one. In fact, in some ways, better because it goes on forever. As you say, the winning uh, is over. Actually, with uh, when you say the uh, Libya is, is the prime example, uh, where and could to some extent Afghanistan, where the weapons fanned out uh, to other people that provided opponents to it, adversaries. But is that bad? Uh, multiple adversaries are also good for the military industrial complex not only in our country and in Europe as well. It's not only Americans who have sold these uh, weapons, though it is mainly uh, these uh, weapons. The, the French, the others, uh, and, and uh, the Russians have big arms markets in the world. Uh, according to the Institute for Policy Studies, last year the average American taxpayer uh, gave about $2,000 to the military with over $900 going to corporate military contractors. Uh, in contrast, the average taxpayer contributed about $27 to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and barely $5 to renewable energy. How do you advocate for peace when so much taxpayer money is going to, we'll call it defense? Well, Republicans in particular are very uh, resistant to spending on social welfare or uh, of any kind for people or uh, anything that in any way seems to compete with private industry. The one thing you can get uh, Republicans to budget money for is allegedly national security, even though almost none of these weapons actually add or are even relevant to our national security. But they are relevant to making threats against Russia. You need Russia. Later, China will be uh, built enough militarily to serve that purpose of the necessary, the indispensable enemy. But now, it, it was hard to keep the Cold War going uh, fully at full speed with, uh, without Russia as an enemy in the 90s and the early parts of this century. So now it's back. And it was back before the attack on Russia. But now Putin has fed into that in a way that I think was not unwelcome to our military industry. If they didn't actually want it, I'm not sure they could even count on Russia actually invading another country. But to have Russia uh, uh, objecting and uh, complaining and posing and threatening to invade, as they did a whole year ago uh, with, weapon, with troops on the uh, edge of uh, Ukraine in, in Belarus, all that was good for business. And uh, it doesn't, by the way, this doesn't justify Putin's aggression at all. He uh, did have reason to feel, in the longer run, threatened uh, Russian security in terms of weapons so close to their borders 
like the weapons in Cuba that we objected to. Uh, Kennedy, Kennedy had no legitimate reason for uh, threatening to invade Cuba on that. And Russia has had no legitimate reason, really, for invading Ukraine. But uh, nevertheless, we've pursued a policy that was warned against going back to the mid-90s by George Kennan and others, the founder of the Cold War in the first place, who said it is an in indescribable error, blunder, mistake uh, to make an enemy out of Russia by moving especially into Ukraine. Uh, some of the U.S.'s top spies and military generals with ties to defense contractors end up as intelligence analysts on various news channels when they retire. For example, former CIA director John Brennan became NBC's senior national security and intelligence analyst. I see you shaking your head. I can't wait to hear what you're going to say. And former CIA director Michael Hayden became a national security analyst for CNN. Uh, how much does this uh, compromise what the public is told about war? What else? What's at stake? Well, it depends what you think the purpose, the function of the media is. In times of war and in our militarized society, their function pretty much is to sell the public on the need for more weapons and the need to intervene. In this country, our media is ultimately controlled by major corporations like General Electric uh, for a long time and uh, uh, many other uh, conglomerates, basically themselves uh, consist of big business. And uh, as I say, war is good business for the media and uh, for the administration, even when it's failing. So, uh, so I'm answering your question. It's natural for them to hire these people. If their message is to get propaganda out, uh, who better to do it than these military or the CIA people? If you want endless war, which, in effect, the U.S. has wanted. So then, and, so, then, uh, so, then, so then what happens, right? What happens when citizens are only told the truth about war uh, after the wars are over, uh, after uh, government information is leaked, after information is declassified? It seems like we only get this under extreme and unforeseeable circumstances from the people who are trying to conceal it. So what does that mean for us? Well, the kind of information that we needed about Vietnam uh, was represented by such as the Pentagon Papers, which was a study of Vietnam decision-making from 45 to 67, 68. Uh, I put that out uh, first starting in 69 and then through the newspapers in 71. So that was somewhat belated, but not too long. But I was put on trial for a possible 115 years in prison. That slowed down quite a few people. I didn't see any other big leaks like that uh, for 39 years, until Chelsea Manning put out hundreds of thousands of files on Afghanistan and Iraq. And she uh, spent seven and a half years in prison. Uh, Ed Snowden, for his revelations, essential revelations of criminality by the National Security Agency, the universal surveillance, not only in our country, but around the world, but uh, where it wasn't so illegal, but definitely against our Constitution uh, in America, Ed Snowden is a, essentially a lifetime exile. So these people and Daniel Hale revealed the drone program. Uh, they did what they should have done, just as I think I did what I should have done. But uh, everyone has paid a penalty very heavy penalty, not in my case. Uh, Nixon actually committed so many crimes, which happened amazingly, almost miraculously, to become revealed uh, toward the end of my trial, uh, kept me from having to go to prison as he had intended. But the others, uh, as I say, either exile or prison, and uh, that discourages people. You mentioned Chelsea Manning. She, of course, leaked information through WikiLeaks, and now it looks like WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange uh, is being extradited to the United States. Uh, and WikiLeaks published, of course, classified information, including documents exposing U.S. war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan. And publishers were integral uh, to the information that you leaked uh, about the Vietnam War. So I'm, I'm curious, from your perspective, what happens if that precedent that you spoke to is set that allows governments to dictate what can and can't be published? Well, if I may put it this way, it threatens to create a U.S. press that is not distinguishable from Russia's today. With Julian Assange, uh, 
uh, extradited, if he, he hasn't yet been extradited, but if he's extradited and prosecuted and convicted here, we will have had the first instance of an actual journalist uh, having been imprisoned for putting out the truth. I was the first source, former official, uh, to give uh, information like that to journalists, and I was put on trial for it. But no journalist has ever been put on trial thanks to our First Amendment, freedom of the press and freedom of speech, which most countries don't have as a law or a... Uh, it will be essentially rescinded uh, if Julian Assange is successfully prosecuted. And we will then approach the state control of information, such as we're seeing in Russia today. All of these cases, of course, uh, demonstrate the importance of exposing uh, the truth about what's happening uh, when it comes to war and other matters. And, of course, your leaking of the Pentagon Papers is a prime example of that. Um, but today, we have an expansion, a rise even, of disinformation. And it's hard to decipher what's true, what's not, what's fact, what's fiction. Uh, how important is it to have actual transparency when it comes to government actions uh, and government decisions about war? I'm afraid that transparency and war are two words that don't really go together. They don't exist together. In wartime, the secrecy that the government carries on all the time about its own crimes and lies and misleading statements and bad predictions and reckless actions, that secrecy is suddenly legitimized in war because you have to keep it from an enemy. That's one of the senses in which I said enemies are indispensable, uh, especially, as I say, long-term ones in a, in a Cold War. We have to keep things from the Russians altogether. Uh, so you, you don't just don't get transparency. And when people do come out, there's two... Uh, they, either get, they do get prosecuted uh, when it's coming out. But the second part of it, which is very dismaying, is nothing much happens. It may affect public opinion to some extent, but public opinion doesn't drive policy uh, or whether a war can be ended or not. Uh, I hoped it would. And in fact, in my case, uh, Nixon was so concerned that I might put out his secrets, which I did have, but I didn't have documents to prove it. But he thought I had documents, and to shut me up, he did domestic crimes uh, against an American, me, which actually figured far more politically than the millions of other people we were killing in Vietnam. But a crime against an American counted more. Unfortunately, when these things have come out, I have to say, not much has changed. So there's a problem with the audience, with the citizenry. You could say, with our species. And I actually, I do say that. Our willingness to uh, support unquestioningly a leader, especially when he or occasionally she uh, can point to somebody threatening their security and she has to uh, shut down public information about it in order to... People go along with that pretty well. And when they find out that not too many of our own soldiers are getting killed, as in Afghanistan, they let it go on indefinitely. Afghanistan was 20 years. Ukraine, I think, if it, if it devolved down, if the Russians came in more, didn't get out, which I don't expect them to do, the U.S. and others will be supporting a guerrilla war, which could be as costly to the Ukrainians as the guerrilla war that the Mujahideen put up that we supplied against the Soviets in Afghanistan. That costs them a million and a half Afghan lives. And I would hate to see that imposed on the Ukrainian people, when, under any circumstances. I've been through a war like that in Vietnam, and I saw what we did to insurgents in the way of bomb. It cost several million lives. That has not yet uh, been the price in Afghanistan, no matter what, what we're hearing about war crimes. But it well could be. So a negotiated outcome in which concessions are made on both sides, however unsatisfactory it might look, to many people on both sides, could save hundreds of thousands to millions of lives. And I would like to see that happen. I don't think it will, though. I don't think it will. Wow. And on that sobering note, I want to thank you uh, for your time, Daniel Ellsberg. Thank you for joining us on Upfront. Thank you.
All right, everybody, that is our show. Upfront, we'll be back next week.